Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, part of the Catholic Culture Podcast Network and the only podcast bringing to life classic Catholic works through professional, high-quality audiobook recordings. Stay up to date with our latest podcast releases by signing up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash get audio. Today's reading, Chapter 3 of Veritatis Splendor, Encyclical Letter of Pope St. John Paul II, narrated by James T. Majewski. Chapter 3. Lest the Cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Moral good for the life of the Church and of the world. For freedom, Christ has set us free. The fundamental question which the moral theories mentioned above pose in a particularly forceful way is that of the relationship of man's freedom to God's law. It is ultimately the question of the relationship between freedom and truth. According to Christian faith and the Church's teaching, quote, Only the freedom which submits to the truth leads the human person to his true good. The good of the person is to be in the truth and to do the truth. End quote. A comparison between the Church's teaching and today's social and cultural situation immediately makes clear the urgent need for the Church herself to develop an intense pastoral effort precisely with regard to this fundamental question. Quote, this essential bond between truth, the good, and freedom has been largely lost sight of by present-day culture. As a result, helping man to rediscover it represents nowadays one of the specific requirements of the Church's mission for the salvation of the world. Pilate's question, what is truth, reflects the distressing perplexity of a man who often no longer knows who he is, whence he comes, and where he is going. Hence, we not infrequently witness the fearful plunging of the human person into situations of gradual self-destruction. According to some, it appears that one no longer need acknowledge the enduring absoluteness of any moral value. All around us we encounter contempt for human life after conception and before birth, the ongoing violation of basic rights of the person, the unjust destruction of goods minimally necessary for a human life. Indeed, something more serious has happened— Man is no longer convinced that only in the truth can he find salvation. The saving power of the truth is contested, and freedom alone, uprooted from any objectivity, is left to decide by itself what is good and what is evil. This relativism becomes, in the field of theology, a lack of trust in the wisdom of God, who guides man with the moral law. Concrete situations are unfavorably contrasted with the precepts of the moral law, nor is it any longer maintained that, when all is said and done, the law of God is always the one true good of man. End quote. The discernment which the Church carries out with regard to these ethical theories is not simply limited to denouncing and refuting them. In a positive way, the Church seeks with great love to help all the faithful to form a moral conscience which will make judgments and lead to decisions in accordance with the truth, following the exhortation of the Apostle Paul. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This effort by the Church finds its support the secret of its educative power, not so much in doctrinal statements and pastoral appeals to vigilance, as in constantly looking to the Lord Jesus. Each day the Church looks to Christ with unfailing love, fully aware that the true and final answer to the problem of morality lies in Him alone. In a particular way, it is in the crucified Christ that the Church finds the answer to the question troubling so many people today. How can obedience to universal and unchanging moral norms respect the uniqueness and individuality of the person and not represent a threat to his freedom and dignity? The Church makes her own the Apostle Paul's awareness of the mission he had received. Christ sent me to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The crucified Christ reveals the authentic meaning of freedom. 
He lives it fully in the total gift of himself and calls his disciples to share in his freedom. Rational reflection and daily experience demonstrate the weakness which marks man's freedom. That freedom is real, but limited. Its absolute and unconditional origin is not in itself, but in the life within which it is situated and which represents for it, at one and the same time, both a limitation and a possibility. Human freedom belongs to us as creatures. It is a freedom which is given as a gift, one to be received like a seed and to be cultivated responsibly. It is an essential part of that creaturely image which is the basis of the dignity of the person. Within that freedom, there is an echo of the primordial vocation whereby the Creator calls man to the true good, and even more, through Christ's revelation, to become his friend and to share his own divine life. It is at once inalienable self-possession and openness to all that exists in passing beyond self to knowledge and love of the other. Freedom, then, is rooted in the truth about man, and it is ultimately directed towards communion. Reason and experience not only confirm the weakness of human freedom, they also confirm its tragic aspects. Man comes to realize that his freedom is in some mysterious way inclined to betray his openness to the true and the good, and that all too often he actually prefers to choose finite, limited, and ephemeral goods. What is more, within his errors and negative decisions, man glimpses the source of a deep rebellion which leads him to reject the truth and the good in order to set himself up as an absolute principle unto himself. You will be like God. Consequently, freedom itself needs to be set free. It is Christ who sets it free. He has set us free for freedom. Christ reveals first and foremost that the frank and open acceptance of truth is the condition for authentic freedom. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is truth which sets one free in the face of worldly power and which gives the strength to endure martyrdom. So it was with Jesus before Pilate. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. The true worshippers of God must thus worship Him in spirit and truth. In this worship, they become free. Worship of God and a relationship with truth are revealed in Jesus Christ as the deepest foundation of freedom. Furthermore, Jesus reveals by his whole life and not only by his words that freedom is acquired in love, that is, in the gift of self. The one who says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, freely goes out to meet his passion, and in obedience to the Father gives his life on the cross for all men. Contemplation of Jesus crucified is thus the high road which the church must tread every day if she wishes to understand the full meaning of freedom, the gift of self in service to God and one's brethren. Communion with the crucified and risen Lord is the never-ending source from which the church draws unceasingly in order to live in freedom, to give of herself, and to serve. Commenting on the verse in Psalm 100, Serve the Lord with gladness, St. Augustine says, quote, In the house of the Lord, slavery is free. It is free because it serves not out of necessity, but out of charity. Charity should make you a servant, just as truth has made you free. You are at once both a servant and free, a servant because you have become such, free because you are loved by God your Creator. Indeed, you have also been enabled to love your Creator. You are a servant of the Lord, and you are a freed man of the Lord. Do not go looking for a liberation which will lead you far from the house of your liberator. End quote. The Church, and each of her members, is thus called to share in the munus regale of the crucified Christ, to share in the grace and in the responsibility of the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, then, is the living, personal summation of perfect freedom in total obedience to the will of God, 
His crucified flesh fully reveals the unbreakable bond between freedom and truth, just as his resurrection from the dead is the supreme exaltation of the fruitfulness and saving power of a freedom lived out in truth. Walking in the Light The attempt to set freedom in opposition to truth, and indeed to separate them radically, is the consequence, manifestation, and consummation of another more serious and destructive dichotomy, that which separates faith from morality. This separation represents one of the most acute pastoral concerns of the Church amid today's growing secularism, wherein many, indeed too many people, think and live as if God did not exist. We are speaking of a mentality which affects, often in a profound, extensive, and all-embracing way, even the attitudes and behavior of Christians, whose faith is weakened and loses its character as a new and original criterion for thinking and acting in personal, family, and social life. In a widely dechristianized culture, the criteria employed by believers themselves in making judgments and decisions often appear extraneous or even contrary to those of the gospel. It is urgent, then, that Christians should rediscover the newness of the faith and its power to judge a prevalent and all-intrusive culture. As the Apostle Paul admonishes us, Once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, 8-11, 15-16 it is urgent to rediscover and to set forth once more the authentic reality of the Christian faith, which is not simply a set of propositions to be accepted with intellectual assent. Rather, faith is a lived knowledge of Christ, a living remembrance of His commandments, and a truth to be lived out. A word, in any event, is not truly received until it passes into action, until it is put into practice. Faith is a decision involving one's whole existence. It is an encounter, a dialogue, a communion of love and of life between the believer and Jesus Christ, the way and the truth and the life. It entails an act of trusting abandonment to Christ, which enables us to live as He lived, in profound love of God and of our brothers and sisters. Faith also possesses a moral content, it gives rise to and calls for a consistent life commitment. It entails and brings to perfection the acceptance and observance of God's commandments. As St. John writes, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. And by this we may be sure that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly love for God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 1 John 1, 5-6, 2, 3-6 through the moral life, faith becomes confession, not only before God, but also before men. It becomes witness. You are the light of the world, said Jesus. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These works are above all those of charity and of the authentic freedom which is manifested and lived in the gift of self, even to the total gift of self like that of Jesus, who on the cross loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ's witness is the source, model, and means for the witness of his disciples who are called to walk on the same road, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily 
and follow me. Charity, in conformity with the radical demands of the gospel, can lead the believer to the supreme witness of martyrdom. Once again, this means imitating Jesus who died on the cross. Be imitators of God as beloved children, Paul writes to the Christians of Ephesus, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Martyrdom, the exaltation of the inviolable holiness of God's law. The relationship between faith and morality shines forth with all its brilliance in the unconditional respect due to the insistent demands of the personal dignity of every man, demands protected by those moral norms which prohibit without exception actions which are intrinsically evil. The universality and the immutability of the moral norm make manifest and at the same time serve to protect the personal dignity and inviolability of man on whose face is reflected the splendor of God. The unacceptability of teleological, consequentialist, and proportionalist ethical theories, which deny the existence of negative moral norms regarding specific kinds of behavior, norms which are valid without exception, is confirmed in a particularly eloquent way by Christian martyrdom, which has always accompanied and continues to accompany the life of the Church even today. In the Old Testament, we already find admirable witnesses of fidelity to the holy law of God even to the point of a voluntary acceptance of death. A prime example is the story of Susanna. In reply to the two unjust judges who threatened to have her condemned to death if she refused to yield to their sinful passion, she says, I am hemmed in on every side, for if I do this thing, it is death for me, and if I do not, I shall not escape your hands. I choose not to do it and to fall into your hands rather than to sin in the sight of the Lord. Susanna, preferring to fall innocent into the hands of the judges, bears witness not only to her faith and trust in God, but also to her obedience to the truth and to the absoluteness of the moral order. By her readiness to die a martyr, she proclaims that it is not right to do what God's law qualifies as evil in order to draw some good from it. Susanna chose for herself the better part. Hers was a perfectly clear witness, without any compromise, to the truth about the good and to the God of Israel. By her acts, she revealed the holiness of God. At the dawn of the New Testament, John the Baptist, unable to refrain from speaking of the law of the Lord and rejecting any compromise with evil, quote, gave his life in witness to truth and justice, end quote, and thus also became the forerunner of the Messiah in the way he died. Quote, the one who came to bear witness to the light and who deserved to be called by that same light, which is Christ, a burning and shining lamp, was cast into the darkness of prison. The one to whom it was granted to baptize the Redeemer of the world was thus baptized in his own blood. End quote. In the New Testament, we find many examples of followers of Christ, beginning with the deacon Stephen and the apostle James, who died as martyrs in order to profess their faith and their love for Christ, unwilling to deny him. In this, they followed the Lord Jesus, who made the good confession before Caiaphas and Pilate confirming the truth of his message at the cost of his life. Countless other martyrs accepted persecution and death rather than perform the idolatrous act of burning incense before the statue of the emperor. They even refused to feign such worship, thereby giving an example of the duty to refrain from performing even a single concrete act contrary to God's love and the witness of faith. Like Christ himself, they obediently trusted and handed over their lives to the Father, the one who could free them from death. The Church proposes the example of numerous saints who bore witness to and defended moral truth even to the point of enduring martyrdom, or who preferred death to a single mortal sin. In raising them to the honor of the altars, the Church has canonized their witness and declared the truth of their judgment, according to which the love of God entails the obligation to respect His commandments, even in the most dire of circumstances, and the refusal to betray those commandments even for the sake of saving one's own life. Martyrdom, 
accepted as an affirmation of the inviolability of the moral order, bears splendid witness both to the holiness of God's law and to the inviolability of the personal dignity of man created in God's image and likeness. This dignity may never be disparaged or called into question, even with good intentions, whatever the difficulties involved. Jesus warns us most sternly, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Martyrdom rejects as false and illusory whatever quote-unquote human meaning one might claim to attribute even in quote-unquote exceptional conditions to an act morally evil in itself. Indeed, it even more clearly unmasks the true face of such an act. It is a violation of man's humanity in the one perpetrating it even before the one enduring it. Hence, martyrdom is also the exaltation of a person's perfect humanity and of true life, as is attested by St. Ignatius of Antioch addressing the Christians of Rome, the place of his own martyrdom. Quote, Have mercy on me, brethren. Do not hold me back from living. Do not wish that I die. Let me arrive at the pure light. Once there, I will be truly a man. Let me imitate the passion of my God. End quote. Finally, martyrdom is an outstanding sign of the holiness of the Church. Fidelity to God's holy law, witnessed to by death, is a solemn proclamation and missionary commitment usque ad sanguinem, so that the splendor of moral truth may be undimmed in the behavior and thinking of individuals and society. This witness makes an extraordinarily valuable contribution to warding off, in civil society and within the ecclesial communities themselves, a headlong plunge into the most dangerous crisis which can afflict man, the confusion between good and evil, which makes it impossible to build up and to preserve the moral order of individuals and communities. By their eloquent and attractive example of a life completely transfigured by the splendor of moral truth, the martyrs, and in general all the Church's saints, light up every period of history by reawakening its moral sense. By witnessing fully to the good, they are a living reproof to those who transgress the law, and they make the words of the prophet echo ever afresh. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil! who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Although martyrdom represents the high point of the witness to moral truth, and one to which relatively few people are called, there is nonetheless a consistent witness which all Christians must daily be ready to make, even at the cost of suffering and grave sacrifice. Indeed, Faced with the many difficulties which fidelity to the moral order can demand, even in the most ordinary circumstances, the Christian is called, with the grace of God invoked in prayer, to a sometimes heroic commitment. In this he or she is sustained by the virtue of fortitude, whereby, as Gregory the Great teaches, one can actually, quote, love the difficulties of this world for the sake of eternal rewards, end quote. In this witness to the absoluteness of the moral good, Christians are not alone. They are supported by the moral sense present in peoples and by the great religious and sapiential traditions of East and West, from which the interior and mysterious workings of God's Spirit are not absent. The words of the Latin poet Juvenal apply to all. Quote, Consider it the greatest of crimes to prefer survival to honor and out of love of physical life, to lose the very reason for living. End quote. The voice of conscience has always clearly recalled that there are truths and moral values for which one must be prepared to give up one's life. In an individual's words, and above all, in the sacrifice of his life for a moral value, the Church sees a single testimony to that truth which, already present in creation, shines forth in its fullness on the face of Christ. As St. Justin put it, quote, The Stoics, at least in their teachings on ethics, demonstrated wisdom, thanks to the seed of the word present in all peoples. And we know that those who followed their doctrines met with hatred and were killed. End quote. 
universal and unchanging moral norms at the service of the person and of society. The Church's teaching, and in particular her firmness in defending the universal and permanent validity of the precepts prohibiting intrinsically evil acts, is not infrequently seen as the sign of an intolerable intransigence, particularly with regard to the enormously complex and conflict-filled situations present in the moral life of individuals and of society today. This intransigence is said to be in contrast with the Church's motherhood. The Church, one hears, is lacking in understanding and compassion. But the Church's motherhood can never, in fact, be separated from her teaching mission, which she must always carry out as the faithful bride of Christ, who is the truth in person. Quote, As teacher, she never tires of proclaiming the moral norm. The Church is in no way the author or the arbiter of this norm. In obedience to the truth which is Christ, whose image is reflected in the nature and dignity of the human person, the Church interprets the moral norm and proposes it to all people of good will, without concealing its demands of radicalness and perfection. End quote. In fact, genuine understanding and compassion must mean love for the person, for his true good, for his authentic freedom. And this does not result, certainly, from concealing or weakening moral truth, but rather from proposing it in its most profound meaning as an outpouring of God's eternal wisdom, which we have received in Christ, and as a service to man, to the growth of his freedom, and to the attainment of his happiness. Still, a clear and forceful presentation of moral truth can never be separated from a profound and heartfelt respect born of that patient and trusting love which man always needs along his moral journey, a journey frequently wearisome on account of difficulties, weakness, and painful situations. The Church can never renounce the, quote, principle of truth and consistency whereby she does not agree to call good evil and evil good, end quote. She must always be careful not to break the bruised reed or to quench the dimly burning wick. As Paul VI wrote, quote, While it is an outstanding manifestation of charity toward souls to omit nothing from the saving doctrine of Christ, this must always be joined with tolerance and charity, as Christ himself showed by his conversations and dealings with men. Having come not to judge the world but to save it, he was uncompromisingly stern toward sin, but patient and rich in mercy toward sinners. End quote. The Church's firmness in defending the universal and unchanging moral norms is not demeaning at all. Its only purpose is to serve man's true freedom. Because there can be no freedom apart from or in opposition to the truth, the categorical, unyielding, and uncompromising defense of the absolutely essential demands of man's personal dignity must be considered the way and the condition for the very existence of freedom. This service is directed to every man, considered in the uniqueness and singularity of his being and existence. Only by obedience to universal moral norms does man find full confirmation of his personal uniqueness and the possibility of authentic moral growth. For this very reason, this service is also directed to all mankind. It is not only for individuals, but also for the community, for society as such. These norms, in fact, represent the unshakable foundation and solid guarantee of a just and peaceful human coexistence, and hence of genuine democracy, which can come into being and develop only on the basis of the equality of all its members who possess common rights and duties. When it is a matter of the moral norms prohibiting intrinsic evil, there are no privileges or exceptions for anyone. It makes no difference whether one is the master of the world or the poorest of the poor on the face of the earth. Before the demands of morality, we are all absolutely equal. In this way, moral norms, and primarily the negative ones, those prohibiting evil, manifest their meaning and force both personal and social. By protecting the inviolable personal dignity of every human being, they help to preserve the human social fabric and its proper and fruitful development. The commandments of the second table of the Decalogue in particular, those which Jesus quoted to the young man of the gospel, constitute the indispensable rules of all social life. 
These commandments are formulated in general terms, but the very fact that, quote, the origin, the subject, and the purpose of all social institutions is and should be the human person, end quote, allows for them to be specified and made more explicit in a detailed code of behavior. The fundamental moral rules of social life thus entail specific demands to which both public authorities and citizens are required to pay heed. Even though intentions may sometimes be good and circumstances frequently difficult, civil authorities and particular individuals never have authority to violate the fundamental and inalienable rights of the human person. In the end, only a morality which acknowledges certain norms as valid always and for everyone, with no exception, can guarantee the ethical foundation of a social coexistence, both on the national and international levels. Morality and the Renewal of Social and Political Life in the face of serious forms of social and economic injustice and political corruption affecting entire peoples and nations, there is a growing reaction of indignation on the part of very many people whose fundamental human rights have been trampled upon and held in contempt, as well as an ever more widespread and acute sense of the need for a radical, personal, and social renewal capable of ensuring justice, solidarity, honesty, and openness. Certainly, there is a long and difficult road ahead, Bringing about such a renewal will require enormous effort, especially on account of the number and the gravity of the causes giving rise to and aggravating the situations of injustice present in the world today. But as history and personal experience show, it is not difficult to discover at the bottom of these situations causes which are properly cultural, linked to particular ways of looking at man, society, and the world. Indeed, at the heart of the issue of culture, we find the moral sense, which is in turn rooted and fulfilled in the religious sense. Only God, the supreme good, constitutes the unshakable foundation and essential condition of morality, and thus of the commandments, particularly those negative commandments which always and in every case prohibit behavior and actions incompatible with the personal dignity of every man. The supreme good and the moral good meet in truth the truth of God, the Creator and Redeemer, and the truth of man, created and redeemed by Him. Only upon this truth is it possible to construct a renewed society and to solve the complex and weighty problems affecting it, above all the problem of overcoming the various forms of totalitarianism so as to make way for the authentic freedom of the person. Quote, Totalitarianism arises out of a denial of truth in the objective sense, if there is no transcendent truth in obedience to which man achieves his full identity, then there is no sure principle for guaranteeing just relations between people. Their self-interest as a class, group, or nation would inevitably set them in opposition to one another. If one does not acknowledge transcendent truth, then the force of power takes over, and each person tends to make full use of the means at his disposal in order to impose his own interests or his own opinion with no regard for the rights of others. Thus, the root of modern totalitarianism is to be found in the denial of the transcendent dignity of the human person who, as the visible image of the invisible God, is therefore by his very nature the subject of rights which no one may violate, no individual, group, class, nation, or state. Not even the majority of a social body may violate these rights by going against the minority, by isolating, oppressing, or exploiting it, or by attempting to annihilate it. End quote. Consequently, the inseparable connection between truth and freedom, which expresses the essential bond between God's wisdom and will, is extremely significant for the life of persons in the socio-economic and socio-political sphere. This is clearly seen in the Church's social teaching, which belongs to the field of theology and particularly of moral theology, and from her presentation of commandments governing social, economic, and political life, not only with regard to general attitudes, but also to precise and specific kinds of behavior and concrete acts. The Catechism of the Catholic Church affirms that, quote, In economic matters, respect for human dignity requires the practice of the virtue of temperance, to moderate our attachment to the goods of this world, of the virtue of justice, to preserve our neighbor's rights and to render what is his or her due, and of solidarity, 
following the golden rule and in keeping with the generosity of the Lord, who, though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. End quote. The Catechism goes on to present a series of kinds of behavior and actions contrary to human dignity. Theft, deliberate retention of goods lent or objects lost, business fraud, unjust wages, forcing up prices by trading on the ignorance or hardship of another, the misappropriation and private use of the corporate property of an enterprise, work badly done, tax fraud, forgery of checks and invoices, excessive expenses, waste, etc. It continues, quote, The seventh commandment prohibits actions or enterprises which for any reason, selfish or ideological, commercial or totalitarian, lead to the enslavement of human beings, disregard for their personal dignity, buying or selling or exchanging them like merchandise, reducing persons by violence to use value or a source of profit, is a sin against their dignity as persons and their fundamental rights. St. Paul set a Christian master right about treating his Christian slave no longer as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. End quote. In the political sphere, it must be noted that truthfulness in the relations between those governing and those governed, openness in public administration, impartiality in the service of the body politic, respect for the rights of political adversaries, safeguarding the rights of the accused against summary trials and convictions, the just and honest use of public funds, the rejection of equivocal or illicit means in order to gain, preserve, or increase power at any cost. All these are principles which are primarily rooted in, and in fact derive their singular urgency from, the transcendent value of the person and the objective moral demands of the functioning of states. When these principles are not observed, the very basis of political coexistence is weakened and the life of society itself is gradually jeopardized, threatened, and doomed to decay. Today, when many countries have seen the fall of ideologies which bound politics to a totalitarian conception of the world, Marxism being the foremost of these, there is no less grave a danger that the fundamental rights of the human person will be denied and that the religious yearnings which arise in the heart of every human being will be absorbed once again into politics. This is the risk of an alliance between democracy and ethical relativism, which would remove any sure moral reference point from political and social life and, on a deeper level, make the acknowledgement of truth impossible. Indeed, quote, If there is no ultimate truth to guide and direct political activity, then ideas and convictions can easily be manipulated for reasons of power. As history demonstrates, a democracy without values easily turns into open or thinly disguised totalitarianism. End quote. Thus, in every sphere of personal, family, social, and political life, morality, founded upon truth and open in truth to authentic freedom, renders a primordial, indispensable, and immensely valuable service not only for the individual person and his growth in the good, but also for society and its genuine development. Grace and Obedience to God's Law Even in the most difficult situations, man must respect the norm of morality so that he can be obedient to God's holy commandment and consistent with his own dignity as a person. Certainly, maintaining a harmony between freedom and truth occasionally demands uncommon sacrifices and must be won at a high price. It can even involve martyrdom. But as universal and daily experience demonstrates, Man is tempted to break that harmony. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want. What is the ultimate source of this inner division of man? His history of sin begins when he no longer acknowledges the Lord as his creator and himself wishes to be the one who determines, with complete independence, what is good and what is evil. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. This was the first temptation, and it is echoed in all the other temptations to which man is more easily inclined to yield as a result of the original fall. But temptations can be overcome. Sins can be avoided, because together with the commandments, the Lord gives us the possibility of keeping them. 
His eyes are on those who fear him, and he knows every deed of man. He has not commanded anyone to be ungodly, and he has not given anyone permission to sin. Keeping God's law in particular situations can be difficult, extremely difficult, but it is never impossible. This is the constant teaching of the Church's tradition and was expressed by the Council of Trent. Quote, but no one, however much justified, ought to consider himself exempt from the observance of the commandments, nor should he employ that rash statement, forbidden by the fathers under anathema, that the commandments of God are impossible of observance by one who is justified. For God does not command the impossible, but in commanding, he admonishes you to do what you can and to pray for what you cannot, and he gives his aid to enable you. His commandments are not burdensome, his yoke is easy, and his burden light. End quote. Man always has before him the spiritual horizon of hope, thanks to the help of divine grace and with the cooperation of human freedom. It is in the saving cross of Jesus, in the gift of the Holy Spirit, in the sacraments which flow forth from the pierced side of the Redeemer, that believers find the grace and the strength always to keep God's holy law, even amid the gravest of hardships. As St. Andrew of Crete observes, the law itself, quote, was enlivened by grace and made to serve it in a harmonious and fruitful combination. Each element preserved its characteristics without change or confusion. In a divine manner, he turned what could be burdensome and tyrannical into what is easy to bear and a source of freedom. End quote. Only in the mystery of Christ's redemption do we discover the concrete possibilities of man. Quote, it would be a very serious error to conclude that the Church's teaching is essentially only an ideal which must then be adapted, proportioned, graduated to the so-called concrete possibilities of man according to a balancing of the goods in question. But what are the concrete possibilities of man? And of which man are we speaking? Of man dominated by lust? Or of man redeemed by Christ? This is what is at stake the reality of Christ's redemption. Christ has redeemed us. This means that he has given us the possibility of realizing the entire truth of our being. He has set our freedom free from the domination of concupiscence. And if redeemed man still sins, this is not due to an imperfection of Christ's redemptive act, but to man's will not to avail himself of the grace which flows from that act. God's command is of course proportioned to man's capabilities, but to the capabilities of the man to whom the Holy Spirit has been given, of the man who, though he has fallen into sin, can always obtain pardon and enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. End quote. In this context, appropriate allowance is made both for God's mercy towards the sinner who converts and for the understanding of human weakness. Such understanding never means compromising and falsifying the standard of good and evil in order to adapt it to particular circumstances. It is quite human for the sinner to acknowledge his weakness and to ask mercy for his failings. What is unacceptable is the attitude of one who makes his own weakness the criterion of the truth about the good so that he can feel self-justified without even the need to have recourse to God in his mercy. An attitude of this sort corrupts the morality of society as a whole since it encourages doubt about the objectivity of the moral law in general and rejection of the absoluteness of moral prohibitions regarding specific human acts, and it ends up by confusing all judgments about values. Instead, we should take to heart the message of the gospel parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector might possibly have had some justification for the sins he committed, such as to diminish his responsibility, but his prayer does not dwell on such justifications, but rather on his own unworthiness before God's infinite holiness. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee, on the other hand, is self-justified, finding some excuse for each of his failings. Here we encounter two different attitudes of the moral conscience of man in every age. The tax collector represents a repentant conscience, fully aware of the frailty of its own nature and seeing in its own failings, whatever their subjective justifications, a confirmation of its need for redemption. 
The Pharisee represents a self-satisfied conscience, under the illusion that it is able to observe the law without the help of grace and convinced that it does not need mercy. All people must take great care not to allow themselves to be tainted by the attitude of the Pharisee, which would seek to eliminate awareness of one's own limits and of one's own sin. In our own day, this attitude is expressed particularly in the attempt to adapt the moral norm to one's own capacities and personal interests, and even in the rejection of the very idea of a norm. Accepting, on the other hand, the disproportion between the law and human ability, that is, the capacity of the moral forces of man left to himself, kindles the desire for grace and prepares one to receive it. Who will deliver me from this body of death? asks the Apostle Paul. And in an outburst of joy and gratitude he replies, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We find the same awareness in the following prayer of St. Ambrose of Milan. Quote, what then is man if you do not visit him? Remember, Lord, that you have made me as one who is weak, that you formed me from dust. How can I stand if you do not constantly look upon me to strengthen this clay so that my strength may proceed from your face? When you hide your face, all grows weak. If you turn to look at me, woe is me. You have nothing to see in me but the stain of my crimes. There is no gain either in being abandoned or in being seen, because when we are seen, we offend you. Still, we can imagine that God does not reject those he sees, because he purifies those upon whom he gazes. Before him burns a fire capable of consuming our guilt. End quote. Morality and New Evangelization Evangelization is the most powerful and stirring challenge which the Church has been called to face from her very beginning. Indeed, this challenge is posed not so much by the social and cultural milieu which he encounters in the course of history, as by the mandate of the risen Christ, who defines the very reason for the Church's existence, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. At least for many peoples, however, the present time is instead marked by a formidable challenge to undertake a new evangelization, a proclamation of the gospel which is always new and always the bearer of new things, an evangelization which must be, quote, new in its ardor, methods, and expression, end quote. De-Christianization, which weighs heavily upon entire peoples and communities once rich in faith and Christian life, involves not only the loss of faith, or in any event it's becoming irrelevant for everyday life, but also, and of necessity, a decline or obscuring of the moral sense. This comes about both as a result of a loss of awareness of the originality of gospel morality and as a result of an eclipse of fundamental principles and ethical values themselves. Today's widespread tendencies toward subjectivism, utilitarianism, and relativism appear not merely as pragmatic attitudes or patterns of behavior, but rather as approaches having a basis in theory and claiming full cultural and social legitimacy. Evangelization, and therefore the new evangelization, also involves the proclamation and presentation of morality. Jesus himself, even as he preached the kingdom of God and its saving love, called people to faith and conversion. And when Peter, with the other apostles, proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, he held out a new life to be lived, a way to be followed for those who would be disciples of the risen one. Just as it does in proclaiming the truths of faith, and even more so in presenting the foundations and content of Christian morality, the new evangelization will show its authenticity and unleash all its missionary force when it is carried out through the gift not only of the word proclaimed, but also of the word lived. In particular, the life of holiness, which is resplendent in so many members of the people of God, humble and often unseen, constitutes the simplest and most attractive way to perceive at once the beauty of truth, the liberating force of God's love, and the value of unconditional fidelity to all the demands of the Lord's law, even in the most difficult situations. For this reason, the Church, as a wise teacher of morality, 
has always invited believers to seek and to find in the saints and above all in the Virgin Mother of God, full of grace and all holy, the model, the strength, and the joy needed to live a life in accordance with God's commandments and the Beatitudes of the Gospel. The lives of the saints, as a reflection of the goodness of God, the one who alone is good, constitute not only a genuine profession of faith and an incentive for sharing it with others, but also a glorification of God and His infinite holiness. The life of holiness thus brings to full expression and effectiveness the threefold and unitary munus propheticum sacerdotale et regale, which every Christian receives as a gift by being born again of water and the Spirit in baptism. His moral life has the value of a spiritual worship, flowing from and nourished by that inexhaustible source of holiness and glorification of God which is found in the sacraments, especially in the Eucharist. By sharing in the sacrifice of the cross, the Christian partakes of Christ's self-giving love and is equipped and committed to live this same charity in all his thoughts and deeds. In the moral life, the Christian's royal service is also made evident and effective. With the help of grace, the more one obeys the new law of the Holy Spirit, the more one grows in the freedom to which he or she is called by the service of truth, charity, and justice. At the heart of the new evangelization and of the new moral life which it proposes and awakens by its fruits of holiness and missionary zeal, there is the Spirit of Christ, the principle and strength of the fruitfulness of Holy Mother Church. As Pope Paul VI reminded us, quote, Evangelization will never be possible without the action of the Holy Spirit. End quote. The Spirit of Jesus, received by the humble and docile heart of the believer, brings about the flourishing of Christian moral life and the witness of holiness amid the great variety of vocations, gifts, responsibilities, conditions, and life situations. As Novation once pointed out, here expressing the authentic faith of the Church, it is the Holy Spirit, quote, who confirmed the hearts and minds of the disciples, who revealed the mysteries of the gospel, who shed upon them the light of things divine. Strengthened by his gift, they did not fear either prisons or chains for the name of the Lord. Indeed, they even trampled upon the powers and torments of the world, armed and strengthened by him, having in themselves the gifts which this same Spirit bestows and directs like jewels to the Church, the Bride of Christ. It is in fact He who raises up prophets in the Church, instructs teachers, guides tongues, works wonders and healings, accomplishes miracles, grants the discernment of spirits, assigns governance, inspires councils, distributes and harmonizes every other charismatic gift. In this way, he completes and perfects the Lord's Church everywhere and in all things. End quote. The Service of Moral Theologians The whole Church is called to evangelization and to the witness of a life of faith by the fact that she has been made a sharer in the munus propheticum of the Lord Jesus through the gift of his Spirit. Thanks to the permanent presence of the Spirit of Truth in the Church, quote, the universal body of the faithful who have received the anointing of the Holy One cannot be mistaken in belief. It displays this particular quality through a supernatural sense of the faith in the whole people when, from the bishops to the last of the lay faithful, it expresses the consensus of all in matters of faith and morals, end quote. In order to carry out her prophetic mission, the Church must constantly reawaken or rekindle her own life of faith, particularly through an ever deeper reflection, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, upon the content of faith itself. The vocation of the theologian in the Church is specifically at the service of this believing effort to understand the faith. As the instruction Donum Veritatis teaches, quote, among the vocations awakened by the Spirit in the Church is that of the theologian. His role is to pursue in a particular way an ever deeper understanding of the Word of God found in the inspired Scriptures and handed on by the living tradition of the Church. He does this in communion with the magisterium, which has been charged with the responsibility of preserving the deposit of faith. By its nature, faith appeals to reason, 
because it reveals to man the truth of his destiny and the way to attain it. Revealed truth, to be sure, surpasses our telling. All our concepts fall short of its ultimately unfathomable grandeur. Nonetheless, revealed truth beckons reason, God's gift fashioned for the assimilation of truth, to enter into its light and thereby come to understand in a certain measure what it has believed. Theological science responds to the invitation of truth as it seeks to understand the faith. It thereby aids the people of God in fulfilling the Apostles' command to give an accounting for their hope to those who ask it. End quote. It is fundamental for defining the very identity of theology, and consequently for theology to carry out its proper mission, to recognize its profound and vital connection with the Church, her mystery, her life, and her mission. Quote, theology is an ecclesial science because it grows in the Church and works on the Church. It is a service to the Church and therefore ought to feel itself actively involved in the mission of the Church, particularly in its prophetic mission. End quote. By its very nature and procedures, authentic theology can flourish and develop only through a committed and responsible participation in and belonging to the Church as a community of faith. In turn, the fruits of theological research and deeper insight become a source of enrichment for the Church and her life of faith. All that has been said about theology in general can and must be said for moral theology, seen in its specific nature as a scientific reflection on the gospel as the gift and commandment of new life, a reflection on the life which professes the truth in love, and on the church's life of holiness, in which there shines forth the truth about the good brought to its perfection. The church's magisterium intervenes not only in the sphere of faith, but also and inseparably so in the sphere of morals. It has the task of, quote, discerning by means of judgments normative for the consciences of believers those acts which in themselves conform to the demands of faith and foster their expression in life, and those which, on the contrary, because intrinsically evil, are incompatible with such demands. End quote. In proclaiming the commandments of God and the charity of Christ, the Church's magisterium also teaches the faithful specific particular precepts and requires that they consider them in conscience as morally binding. In addition, the magisterium carries out an important work of vigilance, warning the faithful of the presence of possible errors, even merely implicit ones, when their consciences fail to acknowledge the correctness and the truth of the moral norms which the magisterium teaches. This is the point at which to consider the specific task of all those who, by mandate of their legitimate pastors, teach moral theology in seminaries and faculties of theology. They have the grave duty to instruct the faithful, especially future pastors, about all those commandments and practical norms authoritatively declared by the Church. While recognizing the possible limitations of the human arguments employed by the magisterium, moral theologians are called to develop a deeper understanding of the reasons underlying its teachings and to expound the validity and obligatory nature of the precepts it proposes, demonstrating their connection with one another and their relation with man's ultimate end. Moral theologians are to set forth the Church's teaching and to give, in the exercise of their ministry, the example of a loyal assent both internal and external, to the magisterium's teaching in the areas of both dogma and morality. Working together in cooperation with the hierarchical magisterium, theologians will be deeply concerned to clarify ever more fully the biblical foundations, the ethical significance, and the anthropological concerns which underlie the moral doctrine and the vision of man set forth by the Church. The service which moral theologians are called to provide at the present time is of the utmost importance, not only for the Church's life and mission, but also for human society and culture. Moral theologians have the task, in close and vital connection with biblical and dogmatic theology, to highlight through their scientific reflection, quote, that dynamic aspect which will elicit the response that man must give to the divine call, which comes in the process of his growth in love within a community of salvation. In this way, moral theology will acquire an inner spiritual dimension in response to the need to develop fully the imago dei present in man and in response to the laws of spiritual development described by Christian ascetical and mystical theology. End quote.
Certainly, moral theology and its teaching are meeting with particular difficulty today. Because the Church's morality necessarily involves a normative dimension, moral theology cannot be reduced to a body of knowledge worked out purely in the context of the so-called behavioral sciences. The latter are concerned with the phenomenon of morality as a historical and social fact. Moral theology, however, while needing to make use of the behavioral and natural sciences, does not rely on the results of formal empirical observation or phenomenological understanding alone. Indeed, the relevance of the behavioral sciences for moral theology must always be measured against the primordial question, what is good or evil? What must be done to have eternal life? The moral theologian must therefore exercise careful discernment in the context of today's prevalent scientific and technical culture, exposed as it is to the dangers of relativism, pragmatism, and positivism. From the theological viewpoint, moral principles are not dependent upon the historical moment in which they are discovered. Moreover, the fact that some believers act without following the teachings of the magisterium or erroneously consider as morally correct a kind of behavior declared by their pastors as contrary to the law of God cannot be a valid argument for rejecting the truth of the moral norms taught by the church. The affirmation of moral principles is not within the competence of formal empirical methods. While not denying the validity of such methods, but at the same time not restricting its viewpoint to them, moral theology faithful to the supernatural sense of the faith, takes into account first and foremost the spiritual dimension of the human heart and its vocation to divine love. In fact, while the behavioral sciences, like all experimental sciences, develop an empirical and statistical concept of normality, faith teaches that this normality itself bears the traces of a fall from man's original situation. In other words, it is affected by sin. Only Christian faith points out to man the way to return to the beginning, a way which is often quite different from that of empirical normality. Hence, the behavioral sciences, despite the great value of the information which they provide, cannot be considered decisive indications of moral norms. It is the gospel which reveals the full truth about man and his moral journey, and thus enlightens and admonishes sinners. It proclaims to them God's mercy, which is constantly at work to preserve them both from despair at their inability fully to know and keep God's law, and from the presumption that they can be saved without merit. God also reminds sinners of the joy of forgiveness, which alone grants the strength to see in the moral law a liberating truth, a grace-filled source of hope, a path of life. Teaching Moral Doctrine involves the conscious acceptance of these intellectual, spiritual, and pastoral responsibilities. Moral theologians, who have accepted the charge of teaching the Church's doctrine, thus have a grave duty to train the faithful to make this moral discernment, to be committed to the true good, and to have confident recourse to God's grace. While exchanges and conflicts of opinion may constitute normal expressions of public life in a representative democracy, Moral teaching certainly cannot depend simply upon respect for a process. Indeed, it is in no way established by following the rules and deliberative procedures typical of a democracy. Dissent, in the form of carefully orchestrated protests and polemics carried on in the media, is opposed to ecclesial communion and to a correct understanding of the hierarchical constitution of the people of God. Opposition to the teaching of the Church's pastors cannot be seen as a legitimate expression either of Christian freedom or of the diversity of the Spirit's gifts. When this happens, the Church's pastors have the duty to act in conformity with their apostolic mission, insisting that the right of the faithful to receive Catholic doctrine in its purity and integrity must always be respected. Quote, Never forgetting that he too is a member of the people of God, the theologian must be respectful of them, and be committed to offering them a teaching which in no way does harm to the doctrine of the faith. End quote. Our own responsibilities as pastors. As the Second Vatican Council reminds us, responsibility for the faith and the life of faith of the people of God is particularly incumbent upon the Church's pastors. Quote, 
among the principal tasks of bishops, the preaching of the gospel is preeminent. For the bishops are the heralds of the faith who bring new disciples to Christ. They are authentic teachers, that is, teachers endowed with the authority of Christ, who preach to the people entrusted to them the faith to be believed and put into practice. They illustrate this faith in the light of the Holy Spirit, drawing out of the treasury of revelation things old and new. They make it bear fruit, and they vigilantly ward off errors that are threatening their flock. End quote. It is our common duty, and even before that, our common grace as pastors and bishops of the church, to teach the faithful the things which lead them to God, just as the Lord Jesus did with the young man in the gospel. Replying to the question, What good must I do to have eternal life? Jesus referred the young man to God, the Lord of creation and of the covenant. He reminded him of the moral commandments already revealed in the Old Testament, and he indicated their spirit and deepest meaning by inviting the young man to follow him in poverty, humility, and love. Come, follow me. The truth of this teaching was sealed on the cross in the blood of Christ. In the Holy Spirit, it has become the new law of the church and of every Christian. This answer to the question about morality has been entrusted by Jesus Christ in a particular way to us, the pastors of the church. We have been called to make it the object of our preaching in fulfillment of our munus propheticum. At the same time, our responsibility as pastors with regard to Christian moral teaching must also be exercised as part of the munus sacerdotale. This happens when we dispense to the faithful the gifts of grace and sanctification as an effective means for obeying God's holy law, and when, with our constant and confident prayers, we support believers in their efforts to be faithful to the demands of the faith and to live in accordance with the gospel. Especially today, Christian moral teaching must be one of the chief areas in which we exercise our pastoral vigilance in carrying out our munus regale. This is the first time, in fact, that the magisterium of the Church has set forth in detail the fundamental elements of this teaching and presented the principles for the pastoral discernment necessary in practical and cultural situations which are complex and even crucial. In the light of Revelation and of the Church's constant teaching, especially that of the Second Vatican Council, I have briefly recalled the essential characteristics of freedom as well as the fundamental values connected with the dignity of the person and the truth of his acts, so as to be able to discern in obedience to the moral law a grace and a sign of our adoption in the one Son. Specifically, this encyclical has evaluated certain trends in moral theology today. I now pass this evaluation on to you, in obedience to the word of the Lord who entrusted to Peter the task of strengthening his brethren, in order to clarify and aid our common discernment. Each of us knows how important is the teaching which represents the central theme of this encyclical, and which is today being restated with the authority of the successor of Peter. Each of us can see the seriousness of what is involved, not only for individuals but also for the whole of society, with the reaffirmation of the universality and immutability of the moral commandments particularly those which prohibit always and without exception intrinsically evil acts. In acknowledging these commandments, Christian hearts and our pastoral charity listen to the call of the one who first loved us. God asks us to be holy as he is holy, to be in Christ, perfect as he is perfect. The unwavering demands of that commandment are based upon God's infinitely merciful love, and the purpose of that commandment is to lead us, by the grace of Christ, on the path of that fullness of life proper to the children of God. We have the duty, as bishops, to be vigilant that the word of God is faithfully taught. My brothers in the episcopate, it is part of our pastoral ministry to see to it that this moral teaching is faithfully handed down and to have recourse to appropriate measures to ensure that the faithful are guarded from every doctrine and theory contrary to it. In carrying out this task, we are all assisted by theologians. Even so, theological opinions constitute neither the rule nor the norm of our teaching. 
Its authority is derived by the assistance of the Holy Spirit and in communion cum petro et sub petro from our fidelity to the Catholic faith which comes from the apostles. As bishops, we have the grave obligation to be personally vigilant that the sound doctrine of faith and morals is taught in our dioceses. A particular responsibility is incumbent upon bishops with regard to Catholic institutions. Whether these are agencies for the pastoral care of the family or for social work, or institutions dedicated to teaching or health care, bishops can canonically erect and recognize these structures and delegate certain responsibilities to them. Nevertheless, bishops are never relieved of their own personal obligations. It falls to them, in communion with the Holy See, both to grant the title Catholic to church-related schools, universities, healthcare facilities, and counseling services, and, in cases of a serious failure to live up to that title, to take it away. In the heart of every Christian, in the inmost depths of each person, there is always an echo of the question which the young man in the gospel once asked Jesus. Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Everyone, however, needs to address this question to the good teacher, since he is the only one who can answer in the fullness of truth, in all situations, in the most varied of circumstances. And when Christians ask him the question which rises from their conscience, the Lord replies in the words of the new covenant which have been entrusted to his church. As the Apostle Paul said of himself, We have been sent to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The church's answer to man's questions contains the wisdom and power of Christ crucified, the truth which gives of itself. When people ask the church the questions raised by their consciences, when the faithful in the church turn to their bishops and pastors, the church's reply contains the voice of Jesus Christ, the voice of the truth about good and evil. In the words spoken by the church there resounds in people's inmost being the voice of God who alone is good, who alone is love. Through the anointing of the Spirit, this gentle but challenging word becomes light and life for man. Again, the Apostle Paul invites us to have confidence, because our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not in a written code, but in the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being changed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 5-6, through 17-18 Conclusion Mary, Mother of Mercy at the end of these considerations, let us entrust ourselves, the sufferings and the joys of our life, the moral life of believers and people of good will, and the research of moralists, to Mary, Mother of God and Mother of Mercy. Mary is Mother of Mercy because her Son, Jesus Christ, was sent by the Father as the revelation of God's mercy. Christ came not to condemn, but to forgive to show mercy. And the greatest mercy of all is found in His being in our midst and calling us to meet Him and to confess with Peter that He is the Son of the living God. No human sin can erase the mercy of God or prevent Him from unleashing all His triumphant power if we only call upon Him. Indeed, sin itself makes even more radiant the love of the Father who, in order to ransom a slave, sacrificed his son. His mercy towards us is redemption. This mercy reaches its fullness in the gift of the Spirit, who bestows new life and demands that it be lived. No matter how many and great the obstacles put in his way by human frailty and sin, the Spirit, 
who renews the face of the earth, makes possible the miracle of the perfect accomplishment of the good. This renewal, which gives the ability to do what is good, noble, beautiful, pleasing to God, and in conformity with His will, is in some way the flowering of the gift of mercy, which offers liberation from the slavery of evil and gives the strength to sin no more. Through the gift of new life, Jesus makes us sharers in his love and leads us to the Father in the Spirit. Such is the consoling certainty of Christian faith, the source of its profound humanity and extraordinary simplicity. At times, in the discussions about new and complex moral problems, it can seem that Christian morality is in itself too demanding, difficult to understand, and almost impossible to practice. This is untrue. Since Christian morality consists in the simplicity of the gospel, in following Jesus Christ, in abandoning oneself to him, in letting oneself be transformed by his grace and renewed by his mercy, gifts which come to us in the living communion of his church. St. Augustine reminds us that, quote, He who would live has a place to live and has everything needed to live. Let him draw near. Let him believe. Let him become part of the body that he may have life. Let him not shrink from the unity of the members. End quote. By the light of the Holy Spirit, the living essence of Christian morality can be understood by everyone, even the least learned, but particularly those who are able to preserve an undivided heart. On the other hand, this evangelical simplicity does not exempt one from facing reality in its complexity. Rather, it can lead to a more genuine understanding of reality, inasmuch as following Christ will gradually bring out the distinctive character of authentic Christian morality, while providing the vital energy needed to carry it out. It is the task of the Church's magisterium to see that the dynamic process of following Christ develops in an organic manner without the falsification or obscuring of its moral demands, with all their consequences. The one who loves Christ keeps his commandments. Mary is also Mother of Mercy, because it is to her that Jesus entrusts his Church and all humanity. At the foot of the cross, when she accepts John as her son, when she asks, together with Christ, Forgiveness from the Father for those who do not know what they do. Mary experiences, in perfect docility to the Spirit, the richness and the universality of God's love, which opens her heart and enables it to embrace the entire human race. Thus Mary becomes mother of each and every one of us, the mother who obtains for us divine mercy. Mary is the radiant sign and inviting model of the moral life. As St. Ambrose put it, quote, The life of this one person can serve as a model for everyone. End quote. And while speaking specifically to virgins but within a context open to all, he affirmed, quote, The first stimulus to learning is the nobility of the teacher. Who can be more noble than the mother of God? Who can be more glorious than the one chosen by glory itself? End quote. Mary lived and exercised her freedom precisely by giving herself to God and accepting God's gift within herself. Until the time of his birth, she sheltered in her womb the Son of God who became man. She raised him and enabled him to grow, and she accompanied him in that supreme act of freedom which is the complete sacrifice of his own life. By the gift of herself, Mary entered fully into the plan of God who gives himself to the world. By accepting and pondering in her heart events which she did not always understand, she became the model of all those who hear the word of God and keep it, and merited the title of Seat of Wisdom. This wisdom is Jesus Christ himself, the eternal word of God, who perfectly reveals and accomplishes the will of the Father. 
Mary invites everyone to accept this wisdom. To us too she addresses the command she gave to the servants at Cana in Galilee during the marriage feast. Do whatever he tells you. Mary shares our human condition, but in complete openness to the grace of God. Not having known sin, she is able to have compassion on every kind of weakness. She understands sinful man and loves him with a mother's love. Precisely for this reason, she is on the side of truth and shares the church's burden in recalling always and to everyone the demands of morality. Nor does she permit sinful man to be deceived by those who claim to love him by justifying his sin. For she knows that the sacrifice of Christ her Son would thus be emptied of its power. No absolution offered by beguiling doctrines, even in the areas of philosophy and theology, can make man truly happy. Only the cross and the glory of the risen Christ can grant peace to his conscience and salvation to his life. O Mary, Mother of Mercy, Watch over all people, that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power, that man may not stray from the path of the good or become blind to sin, but may put his hope ever more fully in God, who is rich in mercy. May he carry out the good works prepared by God beforehand, and so live completely for the praise of his glory. Given in Rome, at St. Peter's, on August 6, Feast of the Transfiguration of the Lord, in the year 1993, the 15th of my pontificate. John Paul II This has been Veritatis Splendor, encyclical letter of Pope St. John Paul II regarding certain fundamental questions of the Church's moral teaching. Narrated by James T. Majewski. Production copyright 2023 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and more at catholicculture.org.